Yes, a big thank you to you, Margaret. It's a delight to be here in Kamloops and thank you for presenting this exhibition in your really terrific program. And it's a program that I think we all follow across the country as well. And I was so moved by Dina Jewell's uh, prayer and her welcome and her family. It was, it was really touching. And in fact, it's been very poignant to be here on the traditional lands of the Tkamloops to Shewepnik people this week, when I think all of us um, across the country have been thinking about the truths of, uh, that have been revealed and what our individual roles are. In, in this process of reconciliation as we think about the past and, and move towards a future. And in working on Alicia's work this week while we've been installing, there's, there's been a number of moments when I've been reminded um, uh, of the intersections and some of the parallels in Alicia's work that make me think about intergenerational trauma um, and, and the histories of pain and racism that, that black people and indigenous people have endured on this continent. So um, it's, been a, it's been a week of thinking. Um, but before we get into the exhibition, I also wanted to mention Gaetan Verna for being the matchmaker, mm -hmm. uh, for bringing Alicia and I together, and I think what has been a very happy relationship, yes. right? Yes. Yes. Um, and, and for those of you who might not know, we are losing Gaetan to our neighbors to the south. Uh, she has been a beacon of excellence in Toronto. The program at the power plant has been exceptional. Um, you have shown how to show diverse things in, a, in an exciting way, not only to Toronto, but to the rest of the country and around the world. So um, we hope that your stay will not be very long. Um, <laughs> before you come back to, to this country. Uh, but in the meantime, we wish you a lot of success. Okay, Alicia, All let's right. find out more about you. Hi, Ernie, nice to see you. <laughs> um, yeah, so, tell us about your first art experiences. Okay, so I think, um, you know, I was always an artist. I sort of knew I was an artist very early on, and uh, my parents fortunately embraced that, and and so I just went down that path. And it's sort of nice if you have a clear vision of what moves and propels you, uh, and especially as a teacher, I see students that are questioning and not sure. And so to have that certainty when I was young. Um, was important and it was validated by teachers and family. And so I went to undergraduate at the Art Institute in Chicago and then uh, for my BFA and then my terminal degree uh, at Yale um, School of Art. And those were very different experiences, but very um, you know, worthwhile experiences in different ways. And you have received awards and further acknowledgements from the Joan Mitchell Foundation, from the Ford Foundation. You received a Guggenheim. Um, you were in the Havana Biennale. Yes. Um, so those are all feathers you right. have. And then being able to do residencies in different places so, so that you can sort of focus on the work and be supported by those institutions are always uh, important. And, and we tell students to apply for those and be ready for that. Yeah, and now in the ladies and gentlemen in the collection of the National Gallery of Canada too. Yeah, uh, some of the pieces in the next room. Yeah, um, what about significant life experiences? Uh, yes. Do you want to talk? Like especially when you went to Africa, okay. do you want to talk? About so that? Uh, when I was young, uh, I wanted to be a Peace Corps volunteer, um, and so um, I put it off because I was in school and everything else was important or more important it seemed, and so finally. I, um, as I say, realized that what's important you make time for. And so I sort of put a pause on things that were sort of going well in my life because I wanted to do the Peace Corps. And then I filled out the application. I was in Provincetown doing a residency at the time and I had to go get fingerprinted. And it was a, a like a one house, one policeman, uh, police station. And he'd never done a fingerprint for, you know, a Peace Corps application. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we got it done. It was sent out. I left it very open because I, I didn't, uh, I wanted to be in the Peace Corps. And where I was sent or was asked to be, I was open to being there. 
And so fortunately, Ghana was one of the countries that were requesting art educators because I really thought maybe I'd be teaching English or doing forestry or something. So I was in a small village and, um, in, the, in Ghana called Domia Bra, and I was teaching at a, sen um, a secondary school and, uh, and living in a communal house with a family. And it was a, a great experience. It was trying, but it was a great experience. And it was the, uh, the first time that I was in a place where, well, not the first time, but I was in a country that everyone sort of, you know, looked like me. And, uh, but, uh, and so sort of saw me, but didn't see me. Uh, I didn't get special treatment, like some of my white or other Peace Corps volunteers, like they would get maybe seated in the front of the bus and nobody would really recognize me. I'm like, I, I'm a Peace Corps volunteer too. But, uh, you know, it, it, but I'm just saying that it was a, a great experience and living with the family also sort of expedited, expedited that. It was challenging, but um, it was great. And, and it impacted and influenced my work in terms of the crafts that I saw there. And crafts have always been important in my life, but seeing them being made and being used in a very functional way was transformative. Yeah, you have a collection of masks at home, and is that where you would have acquired some of the masks? So uh, some, yes, and some before, because I've always liked masks. Right. Um, and how did you arrive at Nashville? So Nashville, um, as Margaret says, uh, Fisk University, which is a historically black university, is there and it has a fantastic art collection and it uh, sort of opened in 1866, which you know soon after uh, slavery ended in the United States and for the you know, education of newly freed um, enslaved people. And so I always wanted to teach a historically black university at some point and this has that great collection. And so it was, a match made in heaven, and I didn't think I'd still be there, but since 1997, I've been there, and I'm still there, and I received a gold watch not so long ago. <laughs> so, um, but yeah. And, and what does that university provide for, for Black students? Is it a safe space? Uh, so it, it definitely is. I think students that come there come for different reasons. Like students might be legacy, where their families went there, and it's a tradition that they will continue. Um, some students, they have been in predominantly white ins institutions all their life, and they want a different experience. Um, and so it's it's a multitude of reasons why they're they're there. Um, it's small. It's quite small, and they like the intimacy that they have with their professors. We get to know them quite well, and so it's a it's a range. But yeah. um, when I first visited you f uh, five years ago to do a studio <laughs> visit that was just so exciting uh, to go into your space, um, I did go to Frisk, uh, Frisk Museum uh, to see the exhibition that was on there. And it was called We Shall Overcome Civil Rights and the Nashville Press. And I actually copied down a portion of the didactics. As a curator, I often think people don't read the didactics, but I actually copied them down. And I do want to quote from it. Um, While fellow southern cities such as Birmingham, Greensboro, and Little Rock may have been the focus of more headlines, Nashville played an important role in the civil rights movement during the late 1950s and 60s. In addition to being the first metropolis in the Southeast to integrate places of business peacefully, it was a hub for training students in nonviolent protest, many of whom became influential figures on the national stage. During an April 1960 speech at Fisk University, where Alicia teaches, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. himself said, I came to Nashville not to bring inspiration, but to gain inspiration from the great movement that has taken place in this community. So 60 years later, race relations and social justice in America is still at the forefront of, of people's consciousness. And I'm just wondering, uh, if there is any residue from Martin Luther King's uh, speeches, his time there, that notion of a peaceful protest? Most definitely. I think like Diane Nash and John Lewis, who were those uh, two of the uh, fifth students that were, you know, at the forefront um, in terms of being present. But Fisk, Meharry, 
Medical College, uh, Tennessee State University, um, American Baptist College, these were all um, HBCUs that students uh, primarily uh, were galvanized and, as you said, were trained um, in workshops and strategies so that when they were uh, assaulted, they would be able to respond nonviolently because harsh words, spit, you know, all these things were being thrown at them, and so they needed to be prepared. Um, and these were young students, and so lawyers and ministers and teachers were all there to support them. Um, and so that legacy continues. And so earlier when I talked about students that are coming to FISC for various reasons, they know the history of the institution. They know the history from 1866 and Du Bois and, and the, um, the importance of being vocal and, and seen and heard and to act on things that are not right. And sometimes you may have to go to jail for that, right? Um, but if you do, like they did in the 60s, it, they were prepared, there was money there to get them out. I mean, it, things were organized. This was not um, a flimsy thought out arrangement. And so students are still engaged uh, locally, even though students are coming from all over, they're engaged in their communities back home. Yeah. Thank you. Um, why don't we switch a little bit now to your artistic practice? And Alicia, you've always talked about your your work being part of a drawing practice. Um, wh why drawing? Why do you consider this drawing? So um, that's just where I start. Um, and so painting and drawing are my foundations. And so that is a place that I conceive the ideas, I iron them out, and then I move it from there to things that are a bit more um, about form, um, but it starts with the drawing. Right, and I think the line is, mm -hmm. the notion of the line is very present, right. present too. Your work is figurative. Um, what compels you to work with bodies, with images of bodies? So I was just always like the interaction that we have as humans. Um, and so I keep going back to that, even as a child. Yeah, it's just sort of that simple. That is the thing that keeps me engaged and interested. And, and whose bodies are they? It could be your body, my body. It's a, it's, it's a hodgepodge, right? So I often start with, uh, you know, we start with what we know. So I was always, you know, intrigued and, you know, in love with the people in the family, but then you have know, the people in the community and then you see someone sitting there and you're like, oh, this person is beautiful. I want to sort of render them. So it's a, it's a combination. There, there's old figures, there's young figures, there's um, mostly women, some men. Um, most of the bodies are frontal, some are in action. Do you keep an archive of images? Do you have like an image bank or does it really all work from memory? So it's memory and then I have these, these sketches. Um, and so these are, you know, somewhat generic, uh, some of them, right? I go to a certain shape, a certain look, but then I also, as I said, abstract them. So it's, again, it's a combination, but and what about the materiality of your work? It's so rich and varied. What materials are you drawn to and, and why? So paper, of course, uh, a wonderful medium for pencil, but also felt and linen and leather because these things can be manipulated and the formal issues that I want, I can achieve. And so I'm also always looking for formal things to work as an artist, because if it doesn't work, then that's just not good for an artist. But um, yeah, so, but as an artist also, I'm open to whatever the material might be. So I, I like how you use canvas, but <clears throat> you don't use canvas and the times that you do use it, not in a very traditional way. So I feel like you're looking at, at uh, materials that are maybe more common, um, maybe some things that are not always considered to be uh, materials like even how this installation I think we've tried to like we've gone in the corner here well you would never install anything in the corner as a curator that would be like forbidden but um, 
I, I kind of feel that way with your materials too. You kind of go to the side and find something that might be unusual or or, or uncommon. Dip into those underrecognized areas. Yeah. Uh, layering is very significant. Um, if you look at the the piece over there and even here and up close, you really have to look at these works up close to to realize that they are comprised of many layers. What do these layers offer right. you as an artist? Sometimes I, I want to speak to sort of history and things being passed on in terms of generational things. Um, and sometimes it might reference a person's particular journey. Um, and so it, it, it depends. Mm -hmm. And does it come from some kind of um, interior place? Like we think of a mask, we, 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 we have different personas for different situations. and. You know, we might have one layer for our engagement with one person and a different layer with somebody else. Um, and yet, if we peel all of those away, there's a kind of interior space that's a very private one. Mm -hmm. uh, and one that you sometimes can't even put words on. But it's the place where maybe we keep the sense of our past and events that have happened. And is that the place that you draw from when you're making your art, that interiority? No, I, find, I think with this work... Um because it is not traditional in the representational way, in a sense, uh, those hidden things that we have are really interesting to me. And to be able to sort of pull them out and, um, and look at those and is, is important. Um, yeah. And what about the eyes? Um, in some of the faces that you have here, the eyes are not even visible in, in other uh, images they're cut out and they're they're big circles. Did you want to talk about the eyes? The eyes have been seen as uh, the window on the soul. Right. So sometimes it is formal, a formal mechanism to bring the viewer in, and sometimes it is a place uh, again of rest, so that then the viewer can contemplate there and maybe pause and think about things that are happening with them, within them. So, yeah. And what about the scale? Again, there's such a variety of things, the small drawings in the corner, the very large heads right next to them. How do you determine scale? So if I am wanting the viewer to interact on a more life-size uh, manner, then I really want to go larger. But then I also will play with uh, reducing that so that they will be a back and forth. Um, and with this piece here, it was much smaller in a sense, but because some of the imagery I was dealing with. I wanted to be a bit more intimate and bring the viewer in a little bit closer. Right. And the thing I've noticed working now on the, f the fourth iteration of this exhibition mm -hmm. is that you're really good at responding to issues of sight, um, that, that your work really is sight specific that way. Uh, you have to understand that Alicia's studio is tiny. It's like maybe this corner here. It's like full of all sorts of wonderful things <laughs> and you can see that like when I arrived four years ago, there were maybe a couple of those paper pieces hanging on the wall, maybe a couple of these in, on some pile. Um, there was one wall that had maybe a few of the leather pieces and um, and some heads. And but I could immediately see the potential of them. They were so rich and varied and 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 so wonderful to look at. Um, but you really a lot of this work was made for the power plant exhibition. You just kind of counted the months. Let's see, we got eight months that, oh yes, I can do this. I can teach full time and I can make another 50 of these. Right, and, right. Um, yeah, so that work ethic is really something else uh, too. But uh, I think that you, you have a very strong formal sensibility and really respond to sight yeah. uh, well as well. But I think, you know, with students that are here, you have to be organized, right? You have to be organized because life just takes over and if you don't have a practice that is organized you will maybe like drift away from your studio time and so it's important to have a sense of what that is so even if you're working full time to have a designated time that works for you so that you can be in the studio engaging in that and then still if you're teaching which i think is um, an important thing um, i'm an artist that is extremely important, but also I think teaching and giving back is extremely important. So that when you are with students, then you can share that joy and they can sort of absorb that from you. But anyway. 
Um, your work is very labor intensive and and has a lot of the craft sensibilities that you mentioned before. Um, are are you interested in implicating, especially the the notion of women's labor, uh, the, the activity that's been traditionally seen as women's labor, right, and often undervalued, but but so extremely important in um, in family in the household. Yeah. Do you see yourself as a feminist? Yes. 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 Quick answer. Oh, feminist that. here. <laughs> Proud and strong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Not being a hater to anybody else. <laughs> uh, and do you see yourself as making political work? You know, as, as we've talked about this before, I'm a black woman in the United States, so, you know, my body is politicized. Uh, but as an artist, I'm in the space and I'm dealing with issues that are important to me and I hope that are, will resonate with other people. But, um, but yes, um, I'm a black woman in the United States in 2022. You can't escape it. Right. Yeah. Um, and who's your ideal audience? Like, who are, who are you making this work for? You all. You yes. all are. <laughs> and I'm glad you're here today. Thank you for coming. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, what I love about the work is that it's not prescriptive or dogmatic. And it really, it, it, you might be making it from particular places, but as a viewer, um, I find that it's very open that I bring my own associations to it, that uh, what I remember about it is trying to, is those moments of trying to make sense of it um, and the questions that it asks and the questions that it asks of me um, in, in trying to stay with it. So that's what I appreciate about it. Well, why don't we talk a little bit about some of the specific pieces in the show now. Um, as you all came in, uh, you would have passed two by two large heads, of a female and a male figure on your way in, uh, called The Couple. And uh, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about how that piece came to be. So that piece, uh, many of you probably recognize the sort of stereotypical imagery that was there, but also uh, I very much like clowns, and so I deal with clown imagery as well. But the sort of blackface imagery um, has uh, been with me for for years, and so that piece is sort of referencing that, but also um, also clowny. Yeah. Yeah, and just to talk a little bit about blackface, it was uh, these were minst blackface was used in minstrel shows that were very popular for over a hundred years in the United States. And it was where white, predominantly white actors would paint their faces either with, with grease paint or with um, shoe polish or burnt cork uh, and, and would uh, exaggerate racial stereotypes and, and enact caricatures of black people. And it, was, it lasted for about 100 years. It was only when um, the civil rights movement got going in the 1950s that it was seen for the, the, the racism that it was. Um, and that that form uh, was seen as being highly disrespectful and, and was no longer so popular. So uh, that piece for me as a white viewer really makes me look at, um, you know, you, you take an image of blackface and you blow it up and it really makes me as a white viewer confront um, any kind of racism that I might be carrying. It, it makes me do a kind of body scan, uh, a mind scan to, to ask myself, well, how do I respond to people that are different from me? Mm -hmm. um, and it does ask me to be vigilant about those ideas that, and the kind of stereotyping that I might make. Um, and to remain open. And so I think that's one of the reasons that that piece is at the beginning of the, of the exhibition too, that kind of asks everybody to remain open about, about their views of others, of other people that they don't know. And one of the great uh, Babylonian um, black performers was Burt Williams, and he would um, color his face in blackface, but he was a great performer. Um, and so then you have that type of layer which is also interesting to me. So not just the white performers, but you had black performers that would darken right. their face. And he was a, a, a great uh, performer. Again, Burt Williams, but anyway. Yeah, yeah it's complicated. Mm. Yeah. 
Um, and then for those of you that might have walked along uh, the exterior hallway a little bit, uh, the next piece is the, the walk and it's uh, new to this particular exhibition. So we're delighted to, um, in this venue here in Kamloops, to be able to show a couple of new works. Thank you, Eve, again for uh, making that possible. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's the most narrative piece in the show. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? So the idea with the walks are someone is in their space and they're leaving and they are encountering various things through their day or their journey. Um, and so that really is what that piece for me is about. And that's the walk too. And there'll be other walks, so, but, and that, that had to be modified. But I really enjoyed that, that work. Yeah, it, when you go and look at it, it's, it has this idea of the vortex in the middle, how you're kind of, as you might be walking along and you encounter different things and you're torn in different directions, um, how destabilizing that can be. Um, and yeah, uh, it, that's what it makes me think of. Okay, let's move into this room here and maybe talk about Cluster, a piece that you can see that's to your right or, or behind you if you're sitting there. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit, Alicia? So I have things that are more abstracted and then I have the faces that are sort of more generic rendering with the graphite. And I really wanted to have these female bodies that are layered um, in dealing with or touching on aspects of health and body image um, and generational sort of information that are, that are passed from someone older to someone younger. Um, and so it's a play on, on that. And of course I was thinking about Matisse. Uh -huh. Right, nice. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I also like how the bodies are being emptied out. Um, and they're very much individuals, but you have brought them together. You brought them into a community. And I'm wondering how important the sense of community is to you. I think it's extremely important. Uh, Community for me was everything. It shaped and formed me and supported me and, um, you know, chastised me in, in a good way. But I think it's so important. And, and that's why I was really sort of moved and humbled when Dina and her family did their prayer uh, this, uh, you know, this evening. And I was thinking, well, how, how am I going to follow that? Right, right. right. Well, maybe we just need to end it now. Right. But um, so I'm very, very humbled to be um, honored by that. Yeah. yeah. And the piece that we have behind us is, I mean, we call it fragments, but, but Alicia, all of your works are untitled. I'm, I'm just wondering why, why are your works untitled? Yeah, I, I think unless I have a, a title that I'm interested in, I, it's, I'm, it's more about the work, and then I may have a descriptive title after that. I just am not interested in that. You don't want to lead the viewer to a specific place? Yeah. Yeah. Well, but in any case, what you are leading us somewhere with this piece. Right. Uh, and where might that be? So, uh, again, the female body, the female um, private parts, and the power of that, um, and the magnitude of that. Um, but also I have elements of my... I have, uh, I'm an animal person, I have a lot of animals, so a little play with my profile of my, one of my dogs here. Um, you know, hand gestures and those things that uh, are, you know, that we notice, things that we catch and that we notice uh, are sort of all a part of this. And of course, the Egyptian hieroglyphs were, you know, uh, important here for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Emily, I loved how yesterday you said, like, or the day before, it was like the hand gestures are a give and take, and I hadn't noticed that before in the years that I've been looking at that piece, but that's really beautiful, that notion of exchange. And for me, it, um, it, it also makes me think about um, how we sculpt our bodies. Like, we are delivered a body, but uh, there's, there's always ideas of an idealized body um, and wanting to strive for that and now how people do really engage in plastic surgery and um, injections and liposuction and also enlargements, you name it. Um, just, uh, there's just such, a, such an emphasis on 
uh, on what the body looks like. So it kind of takes me there, and it, it's almost like you're, you you a little bit put a put some mockery um, on on that activity. Um, and it also makes me think of the hybrid body, um, hmm. and you know that nothing is concrete and and fixed anymore. That we have fluidity, we have gender fluidity. We you know we all position ourselves on a spectrum, um, on, on a spectrum of continuity. And of course, the the, the third thing for me is that female genitalia is um, central to this piece and. The female body is still contested territory. We think about what's happening in Iran with uh, women and, and face coverings. We know that bodies are still trafficked internationally. And in the United States, you have Roe versus Wade. So the female body is indeed still a, a contested state. Um, let's talk a little bit about analogous. Um, if, if you can just some of you who were fortunate there and can just see a corner of it um, around there. Um, that is a really profound installation. Uh, do you want to talk about that? So the material there is leather and it's been dyed and painted and stained and weathered outside. Um, and the, it's a myriad of faces that have been cut out um, that have various um, features and some you would see with the circle or the smile and I wanted um, you know I was thinking of, of di different things that uh, and so hopefully as a viewer you you can enter it and approach it from where you are um, but I was thinking about the cross-atlantic journey for African Americans but also I was thinking about many other things um, but there's also for me joy and humor in that piece and not just horror. So as I said, when you all are able to see it, it'll see what it brings forth for you. Yeah. 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 And you really seem to give voice to, to those people who are who are gathered there, whether it's horrific or mm -hmm. or somehow joyous. Um mm -hmm. you, you give them a voice. Yeah. Um, and as we're in our doing this kind of mental tour, uh, we have mother and child on the back wall here, uh, which is uh, such a resonant work. Um, you have this ongoing interest, I think, in the maternal. Right. Um, I love some Mary Cassatt, you know. I love the uh, mother and child sort of imagery. I love that sort of dynamic um, and so I often have images of mother and child or parent and child and so that one was a, just a pared down you see the importance of the line and the positive and negative uh, space and a very uh, cool sort of monochromatic color scheme uh, but again there's iconic images of you know mother and child where it's biblical and or you know like I said earlier something from the impressionist right and it's another piece where there's such an economy, to use your word, Emily, again, um, an economy of line to, uh, to be so expressive um, in that work. And the last piece that we'll talk about is, uh, is the, the chorus of women uh, that's in that, that, that back gallery um, that we have called um, <laughs> 13 women, although if you actually count all the figures, there's only um, 11 there. One woman has gone wandering to the... Um, education space here to to bear witness <laughs> on activities there. One is resting in the crate. Um, again, it was all site specific, and uh, this is the uh, the version that we came up with for that for this particular space. And it just looks fantastic there. The the height of these ceilings is is really extraordinary and really gives these uh, these bodies um, a lot of space to express themselves. They're all clothed. Um, these women they have they have dresses. Um, do you want to talk about that change in, in the work? They're Rigo, um, and they're women that you would see on the street and you would stop and stare at them. But various types of, you know, bodies, um, smaller, larger, curvy. Um, and so I wanted that to sort of to be projected. Um, and I must say to Charo, who I had the floor plan, but as often as the case, you're not paying attention as an artist. And I forgot that these ceilings were high. And I, I didn't think that one of the pieces uh, 
that was in the Clear Story in Toronto would work. Um, and so it did work. And I'm so glad that, um, that she brought that to my attention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yes, those women are, they should catch your gaze. They should make you stop and stare. Yeah, and even though they carry scars of, of the past, it's wonderful how you've been mending them. So um, it, one of your uh, activities of, of maybe tearing or ripping and then stitching things back up again, suturing, fixing, um, is really wonderful. And as, as you're saying, all of these women stare back. They return the gaze. Um, and even though they're carrying perhaps a heavy history of a past, um, they are tall, they are upright, they are confident, and they really give me strength um, in, in thinking about the future. Right. What's your view of the future? Are you an optimist or a pessimist? I'm an optimist. I think it's important to be an optimist. Uh, we never know what life will throw at you, and so if you have that attitude, it's great. Um, yeah, I'm an optimist. Yeah. And what do you think the role of an artist is uh, in an increasingly divided society? I think to shake it up and to put your vision out there. I mean, you are a unique and individual and you have this specific idea about things and it is valuable and important and you share it. Um, and Autumn, I saw you shaking your hand. so. <laughs> We're in agreement with that, right? <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yes, use that. If that is your gift, if that is what gives you strength and power, use that and share that. Yeah. Nice. And as we close, I just wanted to um, uh, bring us to the title, Witnessing, uh, just to talk about that for a minute. Um, how do you think witnessing relates to your work, Alicia? Uh, it is being present, listening, engaging, and so many of those things that we often sometimes don't find time to do or say we're too busy to do, but are so important. Um, and that's a part of it. Yeah, and I see the witnessing um, going two ways, perhaps, that, that we are witnesses to all of these figures on all of these walls, um, but that we too are being watched, that uh, some of the, these folks are reading our minds. That's kind of how I feel here, that, um, that there is some kind of dialogue going on that, and that there's a responsibility um, in the witnessing that we do. So um, I, I think that it's a great title. Uh, last word to you, Alicia. Well, again, thank you all for coming out. I know there were many other, from what I was told, activities in town tonight, so I appreciate your your time and um, your willingness to share a little bit about my practice and who I am. And uh, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, before you have the Charo, I think that we want to acknowledge Charo in particular. <laughs> as, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you had a great team, Emily, Matthew, uh, Jael, uh, Christina, other preps. Uh, it's been a, a real wonderful team that you've developed here, Margaret. Um, so it was a thrill yeah. to be here. Yeah, it was not, we came in in a week um, and we started installing on Monday and this could not have happened because I was focused, we were focused there and, and with the team, they were focused on these multi-layer pieces, and it all got done by Wednesday. You know, it, we had time to go sightsee. I mean, right. this is like fantastic. We went out to Adams River today. Yeah. yeah. We've been out to the reserve. We've been to the farmer's market. We are, have been engaged in your community. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So maybe we have time for just a couple of questions before we really go out and celebrate. A microphone here. Is it working, John? Anyone have questions? Donald. I just wonder, um, the, you say disassembling. Um, it's like fragmentation. Mm -hmm. But to me, they kind of look like patterns. Yeah. But I, I mean, um, 
does all this come to a hole in your mind or just stay this way? So uh, it could, in terms of like being re in, in reimagined in terms of the, the composition, uh, with this one, it is sort of set. So for me, I see this as this composition. So yeah. is it like, does this represent things that have happened in history? Or just they are people that just have different are in parts? Oh, so it's, it's not a, a historical reference. No. No. OK, no. thank you. You're welcome. Donald had a question. Uh, thanks both. Um, my question is actually similar to uh, to the last one that you responded to. There, uh, you you spoke about the various bodies of work around the room um, and their arrangements in some ways. Uh, and we learned from uh, you, Dinah, that uh, the the group of thirteen there has become eleven here. So I'm just kind of curious how how fluid they are that way. Might might either of these groupings that we're looking at sometimes become might much smaller or conversely do they actually grow over time and you keep working on them or do they sometimes intermix might some pieces of that okay. sometimes be with some pieces of that if so why or why not okay no like with cluster and fragments these would be these are how they will be with uh, analogous that has changed somewhat depending on at the power plant Diana and I put it up and it was much more about a negative space, and it was a little longer. At the other galleries, uh, they were in, uh, the composition was a little bit different and more dense, and so there was an openness to that. And as an artist, I I know what I want, but I also am open to uh, possibilities. Like for example, with this piece, I envisioned it all on one wall, but my ride or die curator, as I like to call her, <laughs> uh, she had the great idea of it overlapping on a wall. And so I was open to that. And so that has been the way it has been exhibited since. With the piece that was in the Clear Story in Toronto, uh, it was very specific for that site. But then in other venues, I would I changed the, represent, the composition of that. And that was something that was really uh, enjoyable for me. And so in this space, you'll see a different rendering of that that suits the time and this place. Yeah. OK, one more. Or are we done? Oh, Eve's got one here. Um, thank you, both of you. Mm -hmm. um, can we talk a little bit about your use of color? Uh, and uh, I have two questions. That, your use of color, which is quite subtle, uh, it's kind of tonal, but when you get up close to many of the pieces, there's a lot of color and a lot of dyeing that's gone on and so on and so forth. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that. And also, in the piece behind you and the piece that we showed in Calgary called Brown, Red, White, and Blue, there was a kind of movement from one side to the other where one side of the piece like this one is quite dark and you're moving away from dark into light. And I find that really interesting as a kind of compositional idea and a color idea. It seems as if you're, in a sense, moving out of dark and into light, and it's, there's a kind of hopefulness that's expressed in the work. And I, I wonder if you think about that when you're dealing with issues of color and light and dark and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think, you know, as an artist, those formal issues and how you move through a piece and how you move through the space of the piece are really important. And so I like, I'm not an impasto painter. I like layers and I like to build up slowly um, and then uh, yeah, see where that brings me. But I have a very definite color sensibility in terms of what I'm after and then I'm working towards that. Um, but again, as you said, playing with value um, you know, and the lights and darks and those gradations that move us. And as you said, when you have a dark space and then you see light, it, it conjures up all different types of emotions and feelings. And so as an artist, I, I, I play with those. Um, and that's important, uh, play and experimentation. And don't be afraid to fall flat on your face. 
but you know, you pick yourself up. You're an artist. If it paints not right, let it dry and paint over it. Right? <laughs> These are not complicated things, but the things hopefully that we're getting to are complicated and um, and um, important. Anyway, but thank you guys again so much for coming and listening. And uh, please come back with friends that might be interested. The show closes December thirty first. <laughs> Thank you, Alicia and Dinah, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.